This is the Hot Take Hockey Podcast with your hosts, Lucas and John Viveros. Hey everyone, we're back for the Hot Take Hockey Podcast, episode 17. Myself, John, here with Lucas, and I'm feeling a lot better. If you guys listened to the last pod, I was uh, I had a rough week. Uh, still feeling a little rough, but the voice is back, uh, so I'll be able to do a lot of the stuff that I like doing. But uh, Lucas, man, you uh, you led the last pod. It was a little bit of a short one, a little longer one here. We'll still keep it somewhat short, but how are you doing? How's the last week? And man, everything's gone on your face, buddy. How's I know, man. I know. Well, first things first. I'll uh, I'll say this on behalf of all the listeners too. We're happy to see that you're back healthy or healthier at least healthier, and, yeah. and trending over to that, uh, trending towards that hundred percent. So that's, that's always good to see uh, in regards to me, man. Yeah. My stash is gone. I uh, went right down to the woods. So we'll start growing it back uh, for the, for the whole beard look that I usually have going, but right yeah. down to the wood. Good cause. Um, yeah. Another successful Movember. Um, great to see all the donations come in and stuff. So that, that was awesome. Uh, good month of November and on to Christmas and the holiday season, buddy. Oh yeah. Holiday season's rolling in and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff on this pod. So uh, for uh, yeah, whatever we'll obviously talk about in the leading pods, but whatever you guys celebrate uh, the holidays are here. So um, yeah, I think for hockey season, we, we talked about it after the last pod, like American Thanksgiving, what, where the standings are at. As Leaf fans, seeing what Marner just did, 19 games. Uh, Jason Roberts in 18 games, which is really cool. And we're going to see the Leafs. We're recording Monday night here. Leaf stars match up tomorrow night, Tuesday night. Lucas, when we're seeing stuff like that, then even the Leafs play Tampa, Stamkos, pretty cool. I mean, starting with the Mitch Marner one, like 19 games, we're seeing it. Like, uh, what do you think on that moment? And just, he scored a shorthand goal to get her done. Yeah, me, yeah, me too as well. I've I've had my times where I've criticized Marner over the years, but uh, yeah, I mean it's Leaf history now. Uh, the record uh, as far as a point streak goes for the Toronto Maple Leafs, which is yeah. awesome to see. I know last week the game prior to the Lightning one, um, who were they playing in that one, Johnny? Uh, the game prior to the Lightning one where he got where he hit 18 straight and tied. Um, I'm being dumb right now. Yeah, and it was whatever that game they were feeding him the puck for that empty netter, eh? Uh, and I remember talking, I was talking with my buddy Chris about it and they were just feeding him the puck to try oh, to get San him out Jose. One. San Jose. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, but it's great to see it's hit the 19. I mean, if it goes away now, it goes away, but it's great for his confidence long-term. I'm happy to see it because I think this is really good for, for Mitch Marner's confidence. And it shows that when he's on his game, he's one of the best playmakers and best overall players in the league as far as his skill set goes. So great to see. And Jason Robertson, I know that matchup's coming up, like you said, like you alluded to, and Jason Robertson's doing his thing as well, man. This guy is in the heart conversation right now, no doubt. Easy, for sure. No doubt. And I think if we had an early heart favorite for the Dallas Stars team, we would have probably said Ottinger. Mm -hmm. Um, I also did want to say, yeah, sorry. I was watching that sharks Leafs game. I was freaking in bed down bad watching that game, but (laughs) Uh, yeah, pretty cool uh, for the Marner moment. Uh, but yeah, just to give the details for everyone watching. So as we're recording this, Marner's 19 game streak, nine goals, 17 assists for 26 points. Mm-hmm. And I think this is just, it kind of speaks the Toronto market vibe because we are talking about Jason Robertson a lot as like fans and the league's talking about him a lot, but like, this is nuts. Like 18 game streak, uh, 21 goals. So he's got over a goal per game, 13 assists for 34 points over that 18 game stretch. That is like Connor McDavid numbers. Um, he is second. I think he does stand as second in the league, but uh, as of Saturday, he was second in the league in points. Mm-hmm. And when you're talking about a guy like that being in between McDavid and Dry, something like that's nuts. We're talking about a guy that like was not even under contract. Uh, like we thought he was going to be out for a bit to start the season. So Jason Robertson, man, he's been on a tear. And honestly, I know they were kind of a, a, analyze, analyzing it. Sorry, I can't speak. Analyzing it over the weekend, but it's like, Watching some of his goals, it's just pure instinct for the net. Like sometimes he's not even looking at the net. He just brings it in, just a little quick snip. Yeah. Um, obviously, we see some of these goal scorers, like whether it's a Matthews or a Stammer, they've got their own deceptive stick going. But it's like sometimes there's a big windup. I'm just seeing Jason Robertson just rip. Like it, it sometimes it just seems effortless from the guy. So uh, I do think he needs to be a guy that if he does this consistently over the year, he's, I mean, I, I would think you're, saying he's easily a top 10 player right now. Uh, Absolutely. And and Dallas, Dallas being a smaller market team too. It's great to see the coverage uh, really, you know, trending into North America, into the Canadian side of of the news as well. And I think a bit of that 
you know, people aren't going to want to hear this, but a bit of that comes from him being the brother of a Leaf player uh, <laughs> and Nick Robertson. Uh, and Leaf fans, we just want Nick Robertson to be a third of what his brother is right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, great story all around. Jason Robertson right now, as of this recording, third in the league in points, a point behind Dry Seidel for oh, second. Okay. So Dry jumped him. But yeah, on, I think as of Saturday before yeah. the Oilers game, yeah, he was actually ahead of Dry Seidel. So yeah, still top three with those guys. That's uh, that's quite uh, the respect. So yeah, we're talking about that. And then uh, what do you think, like watching the Leafs lightning, what do you think about the stammer? Like w- when you're hitting, so so how many points does stammer have right now? He would now, on the season or in his career? Career. On, on, in the career, he'd be over a thousand now. So that was number 1,000. Okay, um, so he got the, yeah, he got one more. So a thousand and one. So hitting a thousand yeah. points with one franchise before you even hit a thousand games. I was, I was thinking yeah. about that. I was like, obviously just hitting it before you hit a thousand games was like nuts, mm-hmm. but like with the same franchise. Uh, so yeah, as we're recording, it's still, he's one more point than a thousand. So he's at 1,001 Lucas, man, one franchise, a thousand points. Like he's a, Hey, he's man. an Ontario boy, Markham boy. Stammer also went from like this really, really solid, consistent NHL player that I think the fans didn't know if he was going to be, you know, a hall of fame type player or if he was really going to transcend this generation type of player. Yeah. Um, there's no doubt he's one of those guys now. I mean, with the two cups uh, and then the other finals appearance, the other two finals appearances that he had, I mean, over, like you said, point of game player over a thousand points and under a thousand games, yeah. all one franchise. This guy is, is, is unbelievable. The Leafs almost had him. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but Stammer, I mean, he's, he's going to go down as an all time great, definitely for this generation. He's, he's one of the greatest players of our generation for sure. And he's closing in on 500 goals, John. He's almost at that number 500, which is really, um, you know, a big, uh, a big milestone for goal scorers in general, that number 500 mark. And, he has no signs. He's showing no signs of slowing down. So I can for sure see him hitting that 600 goal mark uh, later in his career as well. Yeah. And I think yeah. when we talk about these certain categories and that, that's where yeah. I think like when Stammer got the cup, I think like automatically we looked at some of those guys in Tampa, like Stammer, automatic Hall of Famer, like mm-hmm. Vasilevsky is going to be automatic Hall of Famer, Kucherov, automatic Hall of Famer, Hedman, automatic Hall of Famer. Yep. Like all those guys, once they won that cup, they're in. And I look at a guy and I, I hate... I don't know if I hate it, but we're making it a leaf conversation again. It's like, it'd be the same thing with a John Tavares. Yeah. You know what? He hasn't spent his whole career with one franchise, but once he stacks up those numbers and if the Leafs can finally lift Mr. Laura Stanley, like again, we can all laugh about it, but that's the case. Like you put Mm -hmm. up all these significant numbers and obviously Stamp was more significant because he did it with one franchise, but it's like you do these, you reach these milestones, 500 goals, a thousand points. I think those are kind of like, those milestones that people look at for like a hall of fame career, but it's always waiting for that cup. But at the same time, look at some of the guys that have gotten into the hall of fame in recent memory, Matt Sundin, Danny Alfredson, the two Sedins just got it. So mm-hmm. are these milestones enough to get you in? That's the question. I think some people will look at John Tavares and go, Hmm. And John Tavares stammer being friends. I think stammer looks at it now and goes, well, I got those milestones and I've won the cup. So, He's obviously yeah, John, a lock. It's not. Yeah. And like you said, at John Tavares at his current pace, he would right now be, you know, on the bubble. Right. Um, so that yep. cup would really push him over, especially it, you know, it, it's the bias comes into it. it him yeah. bringing a cup to Toronto would certainly push him in there. Um, and, and I just I, looked up his totals. He's at 921 points in 975 games. So a little under point a game. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, that blows my mind that he's almost a hundred goals behind Stamkos. I know Stamkos had a year on him yeah. um, in terms of when he broke into the league, but Stamkos also was injured for a lot more, a lot longer. So they've played relatively the same amount of games, uh, but Stammer's got a whole hundred goals on him, which is crazy. Yeah. And I, I, the reason why I also brought that up is just because of the relevancy on the 08, 09. Yes. Draft. yes. Like obviously Stammer first overall in 08, Tavares first overall in 09. Mm-hmm. And of course, Mr. Victor had been second overall in 09. So there's a lot tied there. Um, and as you kind of alluded to, it's kind of funny because the whole Stammer to the Leafs thing, and then Tavares ends up coming to Toronto. Uh, so talking about those things and just overall, I mean, yeah, some big players in the league today. Uh, one guy, I think we've already talked about enough, but I want to continue the conversation on, I don't know if you listened to Eric Carlson talking to Elliot Freeman Mm -hmm. and 
uh, just kind of his quote and just saying, I, I thought it was a creative answer. He, he basically didn't say he wants to go or he likes it in San Jose, but he wants to win. So I think that's interesting. I think the fact that he kind of put that in there, if San Jose was to go through the rest of the year and just keep stinking it up, I would imagine Carlson will have a kind of type of way, especially the way he's playing. And I think if Carlson mm-hmm. was to get traded, we're not going to go back to the conversation because we've talked about where we could see him. But the one thing I will say on this pod, because I kind of want to just leave it in people's thoughts, is that if Carlson was to get traded, I know for sure that this guy will not want to be put into a situation where he's battling for the number one D-man. He had to do that with Brent Burns and his production was showing. Now he's by himself as the sole number one guy. And look what he's done. He's absolutely ex- exploded. So I will just say, if he was to go to a situation, and I wonder if it's a situation, I, as I suggested, like a Dallas, Heiskanen's there. So Heiskanen. Does he see, like, that's where I'm at. So keep that in mind. That's all I wanted to put out there. Yeah, and I'll throw it in that uh, I agree with all those points, John, but I think that ability to win, like he talked about, might, uh, you know, that might be more important to him than that number one D job. So maybe a Dallas is kind of, he compromises on maybe a number one D position, but they're a great team right now. So they could go for the Stanley Cup, right? Let's just quickly touch on Cassidy's return to Boston. I know you threw that in there. Just yep. quickly also talking about those two teams. I mean, I, I would say Vegas and Boston, I can't see how, like, I can't see how you can't look at those two teams and go, they're not cup contenders. Like they are, <laughs> they're, they're deep playoff teams right now. Uh, for you on that situation, Cassidy going to a different team, the Bruins getting a lot better, but Vegas with a big bounce back here, kind of what's your thoughts on those two teams in that storyline? Yeah, I'm always uh, one for the revenge games. I know you're one of those guys too, John. So I see Cassidy going in there and getting the job done uh, in this game, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, Vegas and Boston, both t- near t- near the top of the league. So both of these teams are definitely cup contenders. And we've talked about Vegas a ton because of where, not just ourselves, but where a lot of the media and other fans had them slotted coming into the year. And they've just blown expectations out of the water. Right now, they're the clear front runner for that Pacific division. So yeah. Um, Jack Eichel is listed as a game time decision tonight. I think he's going to go. Be- I think he's going to play because it's in his, uh, you know, he's a U bot. He's a Boston guy. So I yeah. think he's going to play that game, but we'll wait and we'll wait and see, but that's a game. I'll certainly be watching uh, as we record uh, the, the, on this Monday. evening. That would be a fun cup final. Though, eh? Oh, oh yeah. Boston, the drama, Vegas. man, the storylines. Yeah. That would Eichel, be cool. Cassidy. All yeah. of that. That'd be crazy. And and yeah. Petrangelo played Boston in the last cup final. Like, yeah, I yep. could probably throw in a couple other storylines in there. But yeah, no, it's interesting. I think those are the two two of the best teams in the league right now, uh, for sure. Um, I do want to transition this into kind of a, again, this has become a Vancouver podcast a little bit at times this year. I really, do want to really go over- quick, Really quick, really quick though, on yeah. Boston. I wanted to ask you one thing. Those jerseys did drop. The winter classic ones, the Boston and Pittsburgh ones. Have oh, yeah, you seen yeah. those ones? I did see them, yeah. And what are your thoughts on them? I know the, the Bruins one, they're using that Pooh Bear again. Or no, I don't think it is the Pooh. Is it a Pooh Bear? It's one of the bears on the it's front. It's the smaller one, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the smaller one. I really it's like the, the reverse one. retro is the big head. Yeah, I really like the Bruins one. I think it's a clean look. Um, just reminds me of a classic winter classic yeah. jersey that we've seen in the past. I saw a couple concepts years. I like better, but yeah, I still don't yeah. mind it. The Penguins one for me, I don't know if it does it. It just reminds me too much of the Pirates, uh, the logo with just the classic P. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's uh, going to be a sweet game at Fenway. So uh, just programming note for everybody listening, because I didn't even know this. Um, it is on January 2nd this year, so it won't be on the 1st. You know, make sure you note that in your calendars. It ain't on New Year's Day this year, which is yeah. a little different for the league. So January 2nd on that one. Yeah, I don't mind them. I think, uh, yeah, the Pittsburgh one definitely gives Pirates five. Yeah. Um, but yeah, talking about significant dates, the Winter Classic, um, All Star, and then yeah, trade deadline. So uh, kind of yeah, better transition. Uh, but yeah, as I was saying, like Vancouver Pod. Uh, I mean, it's one of those things. Like we've kept joking about it, but this is some big stuff. So to give people context or background, if you didn't know what was going on, so. It was hockey fights, cancer night, Saturday night. So this was all kind of a mess of a situation because we know uh, Brock Besser lost his father uh, from mm-hmm. cancer. And that was uh, definitely a special, emotional, uh, that kind of night for Besser. And Bruce, Bruce Boudreaux made the kind of decision the day before, not based on that, but it just, it sucked that it was associated with that is that he was making Brock Besser a scratch. Uh, Dakota, uh, Dakota Joshua, sorry. 
uh, went down with an injury. So Besser ended up going in. So he was projected to be a scratch, healthy scratch. Then he ends up going in, scores a goal on hockey fights, cancer night. But everything behind the scenes is that they've agreed on that there's going to be a trade. So Brock Besser's representative agent talks to Rutherford. They make a mutual decision that there's going to be a move down in the future. I don't know what kind of future, but then Dolly Wall comes forward. Freeman comes forward. Yes, there's been some kind of agreement where Besser, no, he hasn't reject or he hasn't requested a trade. So that's not his own decision, but it's kind of like the guy struggled. It was about to be a healthy scratch down to the third line, but boom, tonight, as we're recording this podcast, Besser back with Pedersen. So maybe everything I'm about to say is so irrelevant because maybe Besser, as I was saying to you off air, Lucas, maybe he ends up going off with Pedersen again, but I still think there's a chance that 6.65, two more years after this year, do they try to move it for the cap space? But then they talk about a max of a Bjorkstrand kind of return, which is a third and fourth Canucks fans. Are you really taking a third round pick for Brock Besser straight up? Lucas, man, what a disaster. The Canucks just, it just keeps on going storyline after storyline after storyline. And then I'm seeing even Freeman throw out Thatcher Demko's name in a trade conference. Like, what do you think of this whole situation, man? The Besser one, we'll start there. I, I think that them playing him with Pedersen tonight is surely to try to extract value. I don't even think anymore that it's, uh, you know, just the best lineup decision. I think that they want Besser to damn right go out there and score two goals um, to pump up that value before they move him, right? Um, yeah. So that that's where I think that one's at. I think his time has come and gone. I really do think he's going to get moved. I think that Brock Besser has had so many... Uh, different storylines of and so many different seasons where there's been talked about, uh, you know, a move from. Oh out of yeah, Vancouver. it's not the first time so, we've talked about it. Yeah, trade. so I think this is definitely the last time we'll be talking about it. Uh, I mean, maybe not on the show because maybe this might take a few weeks. Yeah, but uh, I do think he's going to get moved, John. I, I think Vancouver has finally come to grips with, you know, what we're too inconsistent right now. We don't like the way this core has been structured. Uh, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. There's good players, but they're not working together. And I think we're really going to see the tear down and sort of a retool on the fly. I don't know if it's going to be straight to the, to the, to the bottoms of a rebuild, especially with the way you just signed JT Miller. Uh, but I think there's going to be a retool on the fly. And so I think Brock Besser is, is no longer going to be a, a Canuck in a handful uh, of weeks here. Well, and I also look at it as like what we just talked about in the last pod is like this Canuck situation also becomes more difficult because it's like, if they're riding the line of a playoff spot, exactly how they were last year, it's like, do you, how can you make those kind of moves? Mm-hmm. So I think that's why it's like that you look at the Besser situation because it's like you're not going to make those kind of like Demko, Horvat like moves unless you're getting like this big time. The Horvat one's different. I shouldn't because we've talked about it and it's like he's a pending UFA, so they might just have to trade him. But like in the scenario of core guys, they're not really trying to trade those core guys. More specifically, like a Pedersen or Hughes, they're just not going to trade yeah. those guys. Uh, but then a Demko one, I don't think that's happening in season. And then the Horvat one's just off default if they have to move him because he just won't resign. Uh, and the JT Miller one's a whole different conversation. But that's where Besser comes in. John, maybe a lot of this too stems from, like I know Elliot, Elliot Friedman was talking about it earlier today, but I think a lot of it might stem from this Demko injury. Maybe this was just the final nail in the coffin. Demko gets hurt and yeah. they go, you know what? This just isn't our year. Um, let's peel it back and see what we can get for some of our players. And maybe the Demko injury... You know, you, we don't wish anyone to be hurt, but maybe the Demko injury is is uh, a chance for them, an opportunity for Vancouver to kind of reevaluate and and maybe tank for Bedard. I mean, may, it, it may very well, very well. What might a shift that, that would one, be. Right? I mean, I would look uh, like the dummy because I put faith back into Vancouver <laughs> last week, saying, "Hey, they're yeah. going to squeak in." <laughs> no, unless I mean, Spencer Martin, unless Spencer Martin just yeah, doesn't let them lose, right? He Which he's been good. he's been good this year. Um, yeah, man. I don't know. I mean, the fact that these kind of rumors are spilling out from, I mean, Dolly Wall and Friedman are leading the charge on this, but it's like when I start hearing things like tip of the iceberg, like just the beginning, mm-hmm. and then we're hearing comparisons of like the Bjork strand return of the third and fourth, them not even getting that on a straight out deal where it's like, okay, it is 6.65, two more years. So it's in a tough cap world. Like that's a lot to take on. Mm-hmm. Um, I do want to throw out a couple scenarios here, but when I look at this is like, do we not know who th- this Brock Besser guy is? Like, yeah, he's struggling and he looks to- lazy defensively, but like pulling it up here, it's like, this guy's not like in terms of his potential of production every year, he's not a bum. This guy's scored almost 30 goals one season. He scored over 20 four times, uh, okay. over 25 twice. And 
he almost put up a point per game twice uh, mm-hmm. in a season. So not full seasons, like, but 49 points in 56 games, 45 points in 50 something games as well. Like, I just look at this guy, like someone's got to take a flyer on this guy. The same way Seattle took Bjork strand. Uh, that was for a different scenario because Columbus just strictly needed the cap space. This, this is more of like an internal problem and, and a player struggling problem, but okay. We're making it a leaf thing again, Lucas here. If you're Kyle Dubas, do you not call Vancouver and go, Hey, we got the LTAR flexibility here, but not only that, you guys are willing to take a contract or two that's expiring this summer. Hey, Mr. Kerfoot. Hey, Mr. Angbum. See you later. Let's bring in Brock Besser. Throw him on a line with fellow American Austin Matthews. Woo! Yeah, I, I think absolutely. If you're Kyle Dubas, you got a call. We've been talking about the Leafs needing a scoring winger. And if Vancouver's <laughs> going to give him away for pennies on the dollar, you got to jump in there. Oh especially when especially when you have Kerfoot with one goal, like we've talked about for it feels like weeks yeah. we've been saying he has one goal because we have. Um, this is an opportunity for the Leafs to really address something months and months before the deadline. Like they yeah. can get ahead on this. No, seriously, right now, Lucas, I'm yeah. not I'm not even joking. Yeah. If the trade if, okay, so if Dubis is like is guaranteed that he knows Muzzin's out for the year and he knows yeah. he has that LTIR flexibility. I am like doing it tomorrow, like Kerfoot and a couple mid round picks for Besser. Like if that's the deal, if third and fourth Kerfoot, all right, maybe, man, maybe I seem dumb, but I'm just saying like, you're talking about a guy that can score 20 to 25 goals on a year. And again, it's, it's pricey. It's 6.65 per year, Mm -hmm. but seriously, seriously, man, we're talking about the Toronto offense. Like, it's got to be a scenario where you're taking a shot here. You're absolutely taking a shot. And Dubis took the risk with Matt Murray and he got heavily criticized. And I don't think Vancouver's retaining any cap here. But what I am saying is like, if you're, if you're able to send a contract back, knowing you have the LTR flexibility for the rest of the year, like this is one of the teams where I'm saying the same way we said Colorado going for that center, trying to buy low on a center. And this, and I'm about to bring up a name in a second here, but Besser is the scoring winger that I think if you're the Leafs, you should try to buy low on big mm-hmm. time. I think whatever contending team, if it is a contending team, gets it on Besser. Because I was also thinking of other scenarios where like Arizona or Buffalo as like, if you want to look on the reverse side of things for Besser is like, I'm pretty sure Besser was former teammates with Nick Schmaltz. He was also former teammates uh, with Tyson Joe. So Joe's is in Buffalo right now. Mm-hmm. Um, those two teams would have the flexibility to take on a Besser contract, right? So I think it could be on the flip side, the same way Seattle not being a contender at the time went for Bjorkstrand. Um, in your eyes, do you see it going on the side of a team with the cap flexibility that's not a contender, just taking on Besser for a change of scenery? Or do you think it's the contender type of deal like a Leafs that goes for it because then it's, it becomes a little tougher, but Toronto has the different type of scenario because of obviously the injuries. I think realistically, I think it's going to be the, the team, not the contending team, the other side of things, because I think a team like Buffalo has the, you know, the more space and and, and time on their side to make a deal like that. Yeah. I think the Leafs, now that I'm you know thinking about it retrospectively, if, if the Leafs were to make this deal, uh, you know, there is still two years left on the contract and that, that goes for all other contending teams that would come in on this. There's still two additional years and at 6.65, depending on how your other players are locked up, maybe you don't want to have that on the books when yeah. in the Leafs scenarios, a Matthews comes, you know, out of contract. That's Nylander. the one thing I'd say. That that's was, the one yeah. thing that's pushing me away from that now. Um, the Buffalo fit seems like a nice one. I, I knew Montreal was floated out there, uh, but Important to know Brock Besser doesn't have a no trade clause as well. So Vancouver's going to trade him wherever they want. Um, you know, his no, his no trade clause starts in July 1st, 2024. So it's, it's a long ways out. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a tough deal because at his best, like you said, John, he's a 25 goal in the bank, uh, yeah. 60 plus point scorer. And he's a scoring power play, like power play winger who can drive play as well at even strength. Like I think yeah. he's he's a valuable player. It's just can a team like the Leafs who have allocated so much up front, do they see this working in their plans? I don't know. The only thing I'd say on like yeah. on an opposite argument on that is like the Leafs yeah. do have uh, Brody's contract, Muzzin's contract, and Murray's contract off the books leading into that Matthews uh, mm-hmm. contract. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they'll have a yeah. lot more flexibility. By yeah. that year, but 
Yeah, you're right. Also, I, I, I think outside of the Yarncrow contract, Dubas has yeah. shown he really doesn't want to commit to anything past the two-year threshold, right? Mm -hmm. Also, I feel like Vancouver, as much as we Kerfoot can be a valuable piece if he gets his game sorted, and Hall can be a bottom pair defenseman, um, for Vancouver, does it make sense? Because both those guys have a year left. So is this a situation where they take them on and maybe flip them again? Uh, possibly, but I think Vancouver's going to want, you know, they can't really ask for a ton uh, just based on who can take on this contract, but Vancouver's going to want something they can hold on to for past this season, right? Um, or a draft pick of some value that I would I would think has to be higher than a third. Like, right? A third and a fourth, like that Bjorkstrand trade was just such a one-off. I, I can't see something like that going down. Well, I mean, was it a one-off? I mean, look at the patch ready <laughs> trade. I mean, again, he yeah. ended up getting hurt, but at the time he wasn't hurt. Um, mm -hmm. so that's the only thing I think of is like, we saw a couple one-offs maybe, but it could be a come a trend Lucas. If the scenario of like cap doesn't go up to where it's expected. And two, if these contending teams really just, if that's kind of the standard, if all of these like rental team or like selling teams versus buying teams just can't get on the same page for deals, then that's a standard that just might stick. Like these mm -hmm. teams might just be like, we don't care. Like we know you need the space. We'll take that player, but we're not going to give you assets for it. I mean, that's exactly what happened with Carolina. They were like, we could tell you're in a bind. Like we'll take patch ready, but we're not giving you assets. Same thing happened with Bjorkstrand. Like everyone, everyone and their mother knew that Columbus was in a tough spot and Seattle goes, we'll give you two picks. That's mm -hmm. generous. You give us mm -hmm. Bjorkstrand. And you can have your cap space. And Besser and Pacioretty actually have a little bit of a link too, because they are both goal scoring wingers who seem to be on the IR quite a bit uh, in that regard. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, you, you make a compelling case there. I think that that's, that's certainly a good example to bring up when it comes to discussing like a broad. Hey, I talked trade. about the Leafs. If I'm yeah. Zona or Buffalo, I'm easily saucing a third and even maybe a lower pick too to get a Brock Besser because I'm looking at Arizona. Like I said, the Nick Schmaltz connection for me would be cool. I think a Keller Schmaltz Besser line could be fun. And Buffalo, as I said, I think if you're the Sabres, you're trying to build around a somewhat younger core. Besser, like we still forget, he's 25. Like he's mm -hmm. still only 25. I think Besser could be a good fit in Buffalo. So those would be my two teams. If you had a team right now for Besser, that not one that we just talked about, do you have it? I mean, the one that everyone wants to go to is Minnesota because that's his hometown team. Yeah. But Freeman kind of squashed that because it's like they're not looking for offensive wingers. They're not looking for that kind of fit. And they're obviously mm -hmm. money tight with the Parise and Suter stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, could the Devils? I I, I don't have their cap in no, front of I, me. I I actually, Devils... you know, I was thinking about that. That one could yeah. be interesting. That one definitely could be interesting. And even more so because I feel like we've we've had Severson tied to Vancouver. They maybe mm -hmm. need a red shot guy. Like I I like that. I honestly, and, I, and, I like And that. with the Devils, I mean, with this being their first year, really looking good, maybe the organization elects to say, you know what, let's reward the players and let's try to go for it. Go for it this year, right? And we've talked about it too with the Devils is like, yeah, if they're going for it, they're kind of in the early stages of like, again, making it a Toronto thing. Like when Toronto was yeah. early on, they weren't making those big deals. They traded a second round pick for Brian Boyle, right? So like yeah. this could be the kind of move for the Devils, like sauce a third round pick, send maybe one of those contracts, bring in a Brock Besser. That's your addition for the playoffs. Leave it as it is. Yeah, right? it's it's like a it's like a let's reward the team. Let's see what we can really do this year and push for something. But it's not necessarily expected this year, right? So yeah, I like that. I like and that Jack Hughes sauce the and Boyle. Besser on the power play. I think that would get him going a bit. Oh yeah, man. Oh yeah, <laughs> adding Besser to that top six would look nice. I gotta say. Okay, so any last to kind of wrap up the pod? Any last? Oh, okay. So let's talk quickly. Your thoughts on Binner and Barube's comments towards the end here? Okay, so I was looking at this. <laughs> Man, this is a story. Um. Anyways, I was looking at this one, and you know, I, I watched the quote. I saw. I, I read the quote, and then I watched the quote, and I think it's being blown out of proportion a little bit, just because Barube was criticizing the whole team before he moved on to specifically goaltending and and what Jordan Bennington's been doing. Uh, so I think overall the blues have just been such a up and down, like it's, it's so frustrating to watch this year. Yeah. Um, so I think the blues right now are, are definitely in tough. Uh, they have to figure this out now because if not, we're quickly looking at O'Reilly, Tarasenko as UFAs. Do we move them? And then on top of that, like on top of that, then do you start peeling more players off that roster and you really just have Kyrou and Thomas as your staples going forward. 
uh, you know, it, it's not looking good for St. Louis right now. I think when Bennington does get up to this sort of stuff, I think it can fire up the team. And I, and I personally love it as a viewer. And I think like the league needs more personalities like this, but when the team is losing, it's certainly not doing well, doing anything good yeah. for them. Um, so yeah, it, I think it's that's kind the, of key, that the key part of it. I think that's the key yeah. part is like, it just, it has like the backlash effect in terms of like, no. So like blues fans, the blues organization, coaches, players, everything can back. Like, so Benner loves doing that stuff. He gets into it. So everyone in the organization can back that when they're doing well, you're going to hear the outside noise always. Like the outside noise will always be there, but I think the outside noise becomes more relevant when you're struggling, right? When you start struggling and the team starts struggling, then that outside noise becomes relevant. Then the outside noise becomes inside noise. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it goes. And that's kind of to allude to what Barube said. And it probably was taken... I don't know, bigger than it was actually, but I'm sure there's mm-hmm. going to be a conversation between Barube and Binner. Hash it out. Enough of that shit. And I'm probably, if it's my prediction, Binner starting tonight, as mm-hmm. it shows, it'll probably be back to normal. Binner will probably try to stay a little bit more low-key. At least I should, hey, maybe maybe we're recording, you're watching this, and listening, and Binner's done something else. But I think... You love it in the personality. I think it's it, it brings out something we don't see in hockey too often. Uh, but obviously, it's just, yeah, it comes yeah, with when well, you're struggling, then it's different. Well, it also shows, you know, you got to also add this to it, that it does show that, you know, he's frustrated with what's Ooh. happening. And it shows that he cares, right? And I yeah. find that sometimes with this Blues team, there's certain players, you know, I'm not going to go into who I necessarily think, but there are certain players that it looks like they're kind of just doing the motions out there when they're struggling. So, uh, you know, hopefully this lights some sort of fire out under their ass and they get going this week with the Rangers. I know they have a back-to-back. They play tomorrow as well. Uh, and they start turning the corner here. Cause if not, this could be uh, not the blues year and there could be some, you know, some drama and they could be in a lot of our future pod episodes for the wrong reasons. So yeah, blues are struggling, obviously the Bennington storyline, but let's just talk about goalies overall. So the Cal Peterson situation, he gets put on waivers, sent down to the AHL. Like that's a $5 million contract, a contract that the Kings just handed him. Uh, obviously the Edmonton Oilers, another storyline. There's a lot of goalie storylines right now. And like Jack Campbell continuing to struggle. Stuart Skinner taking a bit of the reins there. Uh, you can talk about Spencer Martin in Vancouver, Demko struggles. And now he's out for like what, six weeks. Like he's going to be injured. So Spencer Martin's taking the reins. It is six weeks, right? I think. Yeah. yeah. Six weeks, six weeks. Yep. So it's like, you're seeing all these storylines of like, I don't want to say pure out backups because obviously LA has quick and like, mm-hmm. I think Stuart Skinner's shown he he can play in enough, but like even the Spencer Martin one came out of nowhere. Like, what do you think about some of these storylines, man? And we just talked about Bennington and obviously like, yeah, even Markstrom, right? Like Vladar is yeah, with Vladar, right another story. perfect yeah. example. So LA is such a fascinating one because they've obviously been married to Jonathan quick um, and maybe too long just because of the nostalgia from the cups. Yeah. Um, but they, if you don't remember, like they had Jack Campbell, they had Darcy Kemper for a little bit. They had, oh my God. Um, and you know what? Another they example had Martin is? Jones, like yeah. they had all these guys and they've let them all go. Um, and so with them doing that, you think, okay, so now they're going to lock up Peterson. So Peterson must be a sure yeah. bet because they've let all these other guys walk or trade them out the door. And then they give Peterson this giant deal. And, you know, at the time it was already commented that, you know, he's a young goalie, but it's a little bit quick to jump to a $5 million AAV. Um, And now he finds himself in the minors and he's battling to find his game. But uh, yeah, I mean, I just think thinking Jonathan quick is still your starter is really where this problem started. Right. When it comes to LA. Well, I was just going to say the other example yeah. is yeah. Uh, Carolina Kochnikov starting over oh, both yeah. Ranta and then Anderson uh, being yeah. hurt. But yeah, you're 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 right, man. Like it's that's a problem in itself when quick, but like quick's shown at times when he's healthy, he can be good. But it's like, yeah, I think but they like, jump the gun. Even, he's not even giving you like most. I'm pretty sure his stat line. He's always around. He, he hovers around 900. Like the last like four or five years. So he's yeah. not even giving you like league average goaltending. So like. Why would you marry yourself to Cal Peterson? I, I guess the logic was Cal Peterson was going to supplant him as the number one, um, but that just yeah. seemed far time, and now it's showing. And so, you know, our, our discussion was going to lead into all these goaltenders that are struggling and all these backups that have taken starters' jobs. Um, could there be a scenario where there's a goalie swap? Um, yeah, like a, like a straight-up trade, 100%. I, I straight think out, that, Straight up. I mean – 
we talked about, so this is not a goalie conversation, but we talked about like, so Vancouver just signed that JT Miller contract. It's like, are they going to trade it right away? It's like Edmonton, man, are they going to really trade Jack Campbell like fresh out of, um, fresh out of signing him? But I was also listening. I forget what pod it was, but I was listening to someone basically suggest like, so LA just sent Cal Peterson down. And if you're Edmonton, like no one's taking Jack Campbell at this point, unless it's a one for one bad contract swap. So the value is not going to get decreased by what LA just did. So is there a scenario where Edmonton sends Campbell down uh, to kind of wake the guy up? Uh, Cause I know the guy in the AHL um, is playing well and mm-hmm. obviously Skinner has been playing well. So I wonder, but yeah, the swap is interesting. I also think like LA's kind of greatest fear. Not, I don't know about greatest fear, but like their fear kind of came to life. Cause like you saw a lot of these backup goalies before they had to sign them, they'd trade them and get value. Mm-hmm. So the, the Bernier one before they had to sign them, they trade Bernier, them. Yeah, yeah. Martin Jones. Like I'm sure there's another example in there, right? Yeah. So it's just kind of funny that LA did that a few times. Didn't yeah. do it with Cal Peterson. And then now they're regretting it. Right. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Obviously that can change. And I think people forget that sometimes where it's like these goalies have the abilities and I, and it, Friedman was talking about it on the panel, just saying a lot of the goaltending things is like, or someone else's, I don't know. It's a mental thing, right? It's such a mental mm-hmm. thing. And I even, we've been, is such a perfect example of that too, because mm-hmm. it's like the mental game of like, had to go through his whole AHL and, and route to get there. And then got the confidence, got the streak going and then led into a blues cup. Then he mm-hmm. goes through the struggles. Then when it gets to the playoffs, the mental game is back on and better put some big, like it's such an example there with goalies is like the up and down and Campbell's s- such a product of that that he was put in a good situation with Toronto, went on a good stretch, and the mental game, like you saw, Marner patting on his shoulders, and Matthew's always pumping his tires. Like, when you're on a road like that, it's such a great mental road for a goalie. But Campbell is the epitome of highs and lows, because when Mm -hmm. he's on his lows, he's criticizing himself he's so like hard on himself yeah. like like more than any fan or media member is and yeah. it, it really the whole conversation almost evolves to like goaltending as a whole right it's such a mental sport like you're talking about but has the goaltending position just you know it's a question of has the offense gotten better over the years which i believe it has but also has goaltending gotten worse and have, have goaltenders not adapted to the to the better offensive instincts of the players. And that's what I, I believe in that. I really truly believe in that because there's gone are the days where there's goaltenders who have, you know, nine twenty something save percentages uh, so consistently all throughout the season where like, you know, I, I was reading Jonathan Bernier in his first year at the Leafs had a nine twenty three save percentage in like 50 games. Um, and that guy was nowhere near a Vesna trophy that year. Okay. That 923 now has you right in the Vesna conversation, right? So it, it's crazy to think about like how goaltending now, it's just for three weeks, a goalie can't stop a beach ball and then he's good for a few games. And then there's very few goaltenders that are uh, the elite of the elite for prolonged periods of time. Yeah. Yeah. But- and no, you're right. I think the outliers, the outliers, but no, you are right. I think a lot of goalies that's why those kind of contracts and that's why when they this the jack campbell contract it was like everyone was saying oh it's like zach hyman like they brought him from the leafs it's the five or six or whatever years so yeah. i just think you're right i i think regardless if campbell came into edmonton and played a couple of good years it's like that's just such a dumb contract to sign like i was even saying at the start like sure you might get a couple of good year, good years out of him but at that age too he's been a late bloomer and you know what i think mean, campbell if he was to stick it out with Edmonton here, I think at some point he will turn it around, mm-hmm. but I think it goes back to the conversation. Like, is there some kind of like one for one goalie deal that would like change the scenario and like get a goalie more confident? I don't know if Campbell for Cal Peterson, like I was thinking about that even in my head is like, is that a trade scenario, but in division and, and who Peterson's says no young. right now, who says no LA probably LA more, says so, no? more so just because Peterson only has, I think two years after this deal or a year left where Campbell just signed the contract. He's older. They both have, uh, yeah, they both have injury concerns kind of, but and like, you gotta, yeah. you gotta think LA knows Jack Campbell as a person pretty inside and out and knows yeah. his strengths and weaknesses to, to know that they might not want to go back down that road. Right. They, they dealt him for a yeah. reason. I think there would have to be another incentive on Edmonton's part to make that deal happen. Uh-huh. Um, it's yeah, Campbell's 5.5, right, per, I think, and Cal Peterson's five per. I think that sounds right. Mm-hmm. So the fact is Campbell has to turn it around because, yeah, I mean, I don't see another goalie swap happening 
unless it's like, I know we just talked about Binner, but it's like, there's going to be a few goalies that are in these trade rumors that they, it really has to be another contract going back the other way. So if it's not a goalie for goalie swap, it's going to be a goalie for another contract. Yeah. Quick, quick correction. I did just look it up. Jack Campbell is actually a 5 million cap hit. Oh, um, so Jack Campbell and Peterson have the same cap hit. Same cap. Uh, okay. But like you said, Peterson's got the two years after this year where Campbell's got four more after this yeah. year. So that's a bit of a, yeah, that's a bit of a hurdle right there. And like you said, Campbell is quite a bit older. Uh, he's already 30. Okay. I think um, I had 5.5 in my head. I think that's what he was requesting. I think they got it down to five. Actually, his, sa- his salary this year says is listed as 5.5. Okay. Um, there you go. So where are you pulling it from? But, but yeah, man, like I would love to see a deal where it's like a high, you know, a five, $6 million goalie yeah. switching for one, because it just creates so much drama. And like the odds are, either you know what if both succeed it would be so cool to see um you know both both guys all of a sudden turn it on you know um especially yeah. you know jack, the jack campbell being a former leaf like he always has a soft spot in my heart um but but Mark, Mark, no markstrom's another one man like i i would yeah, yeah. i would i wonder man i freaking wonder like there's so many out there that would be hilarious. Like Markstrom, I'm not saying this would happen again, but it's just funny to talk about. It's like Edmonton was going hard after Markstrom and free agency. I don't know. I'm not throwing that out there. Markstrom for Campbell, imagine. But uh, what about Sergei Bobrovsky? He's even been supplanted by uh, Spencer Knight. That ship sailed, right? Like that, that, that cap hit's just never going to get moved at 10 well, mil. <laughs> uh, I mean, frig, man. I don't know. It would, uh, would Calgary do a Markstrom and Lucic for Bob? <laughs> no, like now we're throwing out stupid scenarios here, but uh, yeah. But it just that... goes to show you, it just goes to show you, there's a lot of goaltenders that are signed to contracts that right now they're not performing to them. And so we might see a trend here in the future where in free agency, this money's not getting you know sent out to goaltenders anymore. Maybe it's yeah. better and best to invest 6 million into your goaltender tandem and have a 4 million guy and a 2 million guy, kind of like Murray Samsonov right now. Yeah. And, and, and do that. Right. Yeah. And I think Dube, Dube is obviously the bet yeah, is showing well right now, but yeah. yeah, the tandem, I think the tandem model is definitely working better in today's NHL. I just wanted to quickly, before we transition to another trade rumor, uh, I did see a suggestion on Twitter that if Florida, again, it's the Ekblad thing and Montour playing well. So I don't even know if Carlson would entertain it, but it's like, could Florida be a team that goes after Carlson bring back Reimer and send Bob's contract to San Jose. I saw that suggestion on Twitter. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that whoa. would be nuts. <laughs> whoa. Just throwing the hot take out there. Not my idea, but it's funny. Um, mm-hmm. Josh Anderson. So I've seen this rumor tied to Calgary a few times. He's a perfect Daryl Sutter player, uh, former teammates, obviously with Tyler Toffoli. So I saw this rumor with uh, Montreal taking the Lucic contract back. What do you think about this scenario? I also saw that Ottawa has kicked tires on um, has kicked tires on Josh Anderson before, and I also did. Dolly Wall put this out there. It, the clip is on Twitter right now. That Calgary has already kicked tires on Brock Besser, so that wow. is hilarious. I think the fact that the Flames and Canucks have made trades before and they're in division, the Flames have struggled. And I do want to talk about another player tied. So I'm talking about a whole bunch of stuff. So sorry, Luke, I'm throwing a lot at, out at you, but. Sean Monahan, 16 points currently in 24 games. The Calgary Flames attached a first round pick to get rid of Monahan. One year left on this deal. 16 points in 24 games. That is matching currently Nazem Kadri's 16 points in 24 games. And Johnny Huberto, 13 points in 21 games, I believe. Lucas, man. Calgary, what a freaking mess. Dan Vladar's taking over the defense. <laughs> like, the offense underwhelming Huberto, Kadri, Monahan's putting up like the same or better production. And maybe the Habs get assets for Monahan, Anderson, like Calgary, man. They're looking for Calgary, looking man. For Calgary, Professor. man. Calgary, man. I mean, I just picked up Vladar on fantasy tonight. So bring Me that too. win home. Me Versus too. The Coyotes, buddy. <laughs> We're thinking the same way. Um, Calgary. All right. I, I just was like many people. I was very high on Calgary coming into the year. So I will not go down without thinking Calgary's going to turn it around. I just cannot believe with a roster like this, they won't turn it around. Okay. So that's first things first, but yeah, you're right. They traded Monaghan to Montreal, attached the first round pick. It's not looking great right now. Um, Sean Monaghan is playing like he was five years ago 
which is, you know, 50 to 60 point, or I don't know what, 60 point guy. Even, yeah, he, yeah. he had even better than that. But yeah, he, yeah he's yeah. probably a 60 point guy when he's healthy. Let's say 60 point guy in, his six, in, in the 60s, which is really good uh, for Montreal right now, because we know they took them, they took him on for that first and then figured, you know, if he turns in a good performance, we can flip him for something at the deadline. He's uh, looking like he'll get at least 50 points right now. Oh yeah, buddy. Uh, so I think Montreal is really liking how this is going. Calgary, I think, man, we probably should have seen this coming with Kadri and Huberto. It's going to take some time to adjust, man. So I don't want to push the panic button on those guys. Markstrom is st- is starting to turn into this goaltender that is like Mr. Really good one year, inconsistent yeah. the next year, which is a cause for concern. Uh, so he's got to figure it out, especially with these quotes, man. Like this whole, like, I suck at hockey right now. Uh, That's not crazy. great. Not yeah, great. Markstrom, but when I saw that, I was like, <laughs> it was a two, wasn't it a two, one game when he said that too? <laughs> Yeah, like, he, like it's it just in any result. Yeah. The conf- yeah talk about goalies and confidence. Like that's why it's just like the confidence in Calgary right now with Kadri, with Huberto. It's just, it's low. Yeah. And I think, man, even Lindholm, I, man, like it's been bad. Lin- and Lindholm lost two line mates again. Like it's just going to take time, but the Monaghan one, I don't think Calgary is necessarily regretting it. I think that going into the last off season, they knew they had to turn the page uh, with, on Monaghan. And I think that they've made their bet and have left that alone. Um, but he's certainly finding a spot in Montreal. Now, as far as trading in division goes, yeah, that would be wild to see either Anderson go to Ottawa or Besser go to Calgary. Um, but I always, I mean, me, if I just put my little GM hat on, I wouldn't be probably wanting to make deals like that just because it can really burn you in the ass. <laughs> yeah. But but we'll see, right? I mean, who knows? Something like that could go down. Uh, but Josh Anderson, the day they signed that contract, John, like five and a half by seven years was always a little excessive especially that was yeah. was before he had suited up for montreal right they, they literally made the trade and made that and signed right on that yeah. deal um so it was almost always on the cards that is he gonna play this full seven years in montreal because i just don't think so well i'll say this as leaf fans let's give let's give respects to what kent hughes in montreal has done so we'll finish off the pod with this and just give yeah. respects it's like so the monahan situation he is one of the guys in this league right now that i think montreal could not only flip, but get an asset for if they retain 50%. And we've talked about Colorado, maybe buying lower, getting a, a cheaper center option. That's an option. Um, and there's been rumors tied to that. So like looking at Montreal, they could maybe get an asset or two for Monaghan if they retain cap or maybe even extend Monaghan past the season. We'll see. But it's like, if you're Montreal, you're trading Josh Anderson. I would get rid of that contract, trade him. If teams are willing to give assets for this guy, because yeah, he is a playoff type of player, trade him. Like 100% mm-hmm. trade him. Uh, I wonder if they'd trade Gallagher. But even, so Ryan Rashog talked about this. Edmondson apparently is getting interest from a lot of teams, including one of the teams being Edmonton, apparently. I don't know if oh, this Ed- is just- Edmonton? Edmonton's in on Edmondson? Well, I don't, so Edmonton, I don't <laughs> know. So this might be, I was listening to Rashog's podcast a little bit, shout out. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he's just suggesting the idea of Edmondson to Edmonton. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's been rumors to say that there'd be teams willing to give up a second or even a first for Edmondson before the deadline. And if that's the case, oh my God, Montreal's just going to keep fleecing teams. Like Ken Hughes is just going to be the fleece master. Like I cannot believe there's some guys, again, Sherratt, look at the return Montreal got for Sherratt last year. If Edmondson even touches a first round pick, Habs fans, you've got to be laughing. You've got to start laughing. Like I will open, like I will allow you to openly laugh on Twitter like it's it's embarrassing, bro. That teams are giving up first for these kind of defensemen. I'm sorry. Like if Edmondson gets a first, Kent Hughes can just be like, my job's done. Like I've like Montreal doesn't even need, like they don't even need to win a cup. <laughs> like Kent Hughes is finessed. He's fleeced too many times. Montreal is just setting up very low key behind the scenes, and it's definitely concerning me uh, as a Leaf supporter. I'm a little bit worried if they get a first for Edmondson, and then they trade Monahan and get another pick there or a young prospect there. I mean, they're really retooling this thing and it's going to look gross in a few years. That's what I'm saying. The only contract that like gives them kind of like, so Carey Price, that's like an LTAR situation unless he makes some kind of miracle comeback. But like, just looking at their cap situation right now, like they are set up so well. It's not even funny. And I, and I'm sorry, Lee fans listen to this. You, you definitely do not want to listen to this, but they are set up so well. And it's actually just kind of scary. Like there are other teams that are set up really well. And I look at, but it's just like Montreal. The only two contracts that are like, if you're a house center making you want to puke are Anderson and Gallagher, essentially. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you can somehow trade one or both of those guys, the Gallagher one's going to be tough because he's 30. 
it's a 6.5. Like if that's your only bad contract and Gallagher can stay healthy and he can be a third line guy, it sucks, but it's like 2 million higher than market. It's whatever. If you can trade Josh Anderson, you have no bad contracts in my eyes. Like whatever. Armia has had his struggles, whatever. 3.4. I'm sure you can trade that when he bounces back. Outside of that, David Savard only two years past this. Matheson, I think at that deal, if he plays well for Montreal, the top four, like that's fine. Like Jake Allen's been so good for you. Like, and all the prospects in the, I don't know, man, Montreal, it's actually scary to think about what they're building. I know, man, like that Jake Allen one, if they can, man, they're like a goalie away from being pretty relevant. I think like, and they're not going to just add a goalie when they do this, like at the, at the next off season or the off season after they're yeah, going to add a goalie, like, they're going to add a scoring winger. They're going to add a, you know, a number one, number two defenseman. Like they add a few more pieces, man. And they're, the way they're setting this cap situation up. Yeah. They're going to be good, man. It's, it's worrisome. Yeah. And they have, they have a, I would say three or four defensive prospects that haven't even touched the lineup yet that are good, but it's like they have three or four young defensemen that have been good. And Caden Gooley has been one of them. So uh, and they only got two years left on the uh, Carl Alsner buyout. So that'll even free up some space. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do got to give respect. Cause I was kind of, I wasn't hating on the ghoulie pick at all, but I was kind of like, I don't know. I wasn't hyping it up and he's looked good. He's 20. He looks good. Respects. Um, so had to finish off the pod guys, a little halves talk here. Cause it's happening. There's some behind the scenes. Kent Hughes is taking dubs and there could be a few more dubs along the way. All right, Lucas, anything else to finish off the pod? No, I think we're I think we're good to go. I mean, moving into the holiday season, everybody stay safe. Yeah. Um, spend time with some loved ones, and you'll hear from us uh, every week as per. Yeah, I do want to apologize. Obviously, coming off the sickness here, I'm still a bit sick. Uh, my words got crossed up a few times in here just, uh, just based on that. But I do appreciate it, guys. We both appreciate it. We both appreciate you guys listening. Make sure to check out the pod. On Spotify and Apple, I do post, if not the full, for the most part, I've been posting the full episode, but for like last week, again, I was sick. So I just posted one clip on YouTube of the pod, but uh, for the most part, we'll post the full thing. So YouTube, Spotify, Apple, the Hot Take Hockey Podcast, Lucas, myself, John, thank you so much for listening and watching. And we hope to see you on the next one. Have a great one. Peace. Peace.